الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم اجعل ما تعلمناه حجة لنا لا علينا We praise Allah the Lord of everything in existence We ask him to bless the messenger Muhammad to elevate his mention and rank and to shower him with protection and grace along with his family and his righteous followers as he did with Ibrahim, his family and righteous followers in the past. We ask him to teach us what benefits us and to allow us to benefit from the things that we learn and to increase us in knowledge. We ask him to make the things that we learn an evidence for us and not an evidence against us. Welcome to another session of prophetic stories, illustrations of life where we're covering the life and times of our messenger Muhammad and trying to extract some lessons and morals that we can apply in our daily lives. Um, so this particular chapter starts with the. So this particular chapter starts with the. And I get to hear myself. And I get if it wasn't myself. scary enough the first time around. It wasn't scary enough the first time I get around. to hear my echo. Bismillah. Yeah, that's better. Um, it starts with the following statement: "Hada yawm wa fa'in wa birrin." Hada yawm wa fa'in wa birr. So this is a day of. Wafa. Wafa is when you are able to be truthful and you're able to pay back in due measure and you're able to showcase high ethics. Now, this is a person, we're going to hear what the story is about, but he's hearing this statement as he was in the middle of a battle he was in between several knights that are on horseback and somebody was shouting at him and telling him this is a document that belongs to you this is a document that belongs to you now this document was from eight years earlier the document that is presented to this man was from eight years ago and he still recalls that particular event and what happened therein and whatever he was promised took place exactly as he was promised it so this man was not even from Quraysh this man was from Arabia but he was from a tribe called Bani Mudlij Bani Mudlij lived in a city called Qudayd now this city and these peoples were told that there is a bounty on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Quraysh had announced in the surrounding areas that whoever is able to arrest Muhammad we will give him 100 camels 100 camels is something unheard of that's great richness um, and so that's for Muhammad's head and another hundred for Abu Bakr's head. So that's 200 camels for whoever is able to kill them or arrest them. So this tells us this is way back in Mecca, in the era where the Messenger وسلم, and his community were facing persecution and they were under siege. And finally, when God permitted him to migrate, He's able to leave the city of Mecca and travel to Medina. This is the time of the migration. And this person was an Arab and he was a Bedouin. The nomads of Arabia, they didn't really have many resources. So that's why they constantly engage in warfare because what they would do is they would take the spoils of war from their enemies. So this person found this as an opportunity. This is basically like an investment. We already go to battle, but in, in, instead of me sharing the spoils of war with other people, I just got to grab two people, and I got this great bounty. Um, so basically, that's one thing. On top of it, again, for the people at the time, the most prized position, possession was camels. Uh, so it's right now when you're a car dealer and you got 100 cars in your lot, you're considered pretty well off. So having a hundred camels was basically similar to that. But not only did they like camels just because of their worth, 
But they also enjoyed them. Those were animals that they really took great pride in. And they enjoyed having them. So he's, he's really looking forward to this. And one time, basically, he was sitting with his people and an announcement was made. And that announcement was, I swear by God that I saw three individuals walking and they were walking on the coastal highway. So now when the Prophet وسلم, he migrated, what he ended up go, doing was they hired a expert desert tour guide. And the expert tour guide was not a Muslim. He was a pagan, just like most of Arabia at the time. But kana khirritan, which means an expert in the different paths and the different roads. Now, the people of Mecca already traveled constantly up north and down south, and they had specific caravan roads. The Prophet's migration path was way different, and that was done by design, that was strategy. And of course, the Prophet would not have done that by himself, he had an expert to lead him. So basically, they saw them on the coastal highway. And this guy said, I think it's Muhammad and his friends, which is basically Abu Bakr and then the guy. That's the three people. Um, so basically, this man, when he heard this announcement, immediately he recognizes that they did not go in the regular path that people are used to. They didn't go on the caravan road. They went on the coastal road. The coast because basically... Mecca and Medina both fall into the Hijaz region, which is Western Arabia. And it's a mountainous region, but right after that, you have the coast of the Red Sea. And the point behind that was so they don't have people running after them. So he recognized, because of his intelligence, that this is an opportunity for me to go, and nobody's going to share in this bounty with me. So basically, he signaled to the guy who made the announcement to shut up because he doesn't want everybody to find out what's going on. He sees this as an opportunity. He's like, kill it, right? Okay, I got you. You don't need to tell anybody else. And then he announces, he's like, no, it's not them. It's not them. It's so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. Basically, he knows people that had traveled and he, he calls their names out. He's like, they came out. And they were, they were looking for something that they lost. They were looking for an animal that had gone astray that belonged to them. So the man who made the original announcement said, he says, possibly, you're right. And basically, what did he just do? He made everybody else relax and not get so anxious or get excited about the bounty. He sits with them like everybody else for a little bit so he doesn't attract their attention by immediately standing up and going. It's like somebody says there is a sale, right? And then you come inside and you're like, no, 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 that's a false alarm. And then in a few minutes, you just make everybody relax and then you go and you get the, the sale. So then he goes to his house and he instructs one of his servants and he said, prepare my horse and put it behind a particular hill that was there so it doesn't attract any attention. And he goes from behind his house. He doesn't go from the front door. He goes from the back. And he wore his armor. He put his weapons. And he takes his uh, arrows and his bow. And then he also does something which they used to constantly do, which is cast lots. Because that was part of their uh, superstitious beliefs. Before they would take any journey, they would do something related to superstition. You know, that's just part of... Paganism. Paganism revolves around superstition. And that's why one of the main things that the Messenger of God came with is to eliminate superstition. So when a believer travels, they just travel in the name of God. And they don't need to worry about signs and look up and where the bird's flying to, what direction are they going, how is the weather. No, you just take off and you leave and you trust in God. So basically he took, he took something that he used to cast lost with, lost with, uh, lots with and he takes his arrow and uh, he strikes it on the ground, on the sand. And the point behind that is so nobody can see him lifting anything up. And then he just goes, ducks down all the way to his horse. And then he jumps on his horse and he just goes. Um, this was actually casting lots for them was their form of istikhara. 
You know, many of us are familiar with the concept of istikhara, and istikhara is simply a prayer. Before we make a decision, we do istikhara. By the way, istikhara does not have to do with two options. Most people think it's like, it's either this one or this one, and you pray istikhara. No. The way the Prophet taught istikhara is if one of you desires to do anything, then perform this istikhara prayer. And istikhara means to seek out the best in any decision that you make. Talabu al khira. So basically to choose the best and to make sure that whatever comes out as a result is the best thing possible for you. Um, so again, Islam came to eliminate that. So whenever we talk about superstition, we have something that eliminates that which is called istikhara, which is a simple prayer. You perform two rak'ahs and after the two rak'ahs you make a prayer and you ask Allah, if, if this thing is good for me, then facilitate it for me. And if it's bad for me, then eliminate it from my path. Straightforward. Um, so basically, uh, when he cast lots, the arrow that he, so they used to do so with arrows. So the arrow that he picked up is the one that would cause him to be superstitious, the pessimistic one, the one that says, don't go out. But he's like, you know what, although I believe in this stuff, but there's 200 camels waiting for me. <laughs> Forget this. And that's what happens with people of superstition. You know, they don't actually have a very sound belief to rely on. So there was conflict of interest. Do I rely on my superstitious belief? Or do I go wait for that bounty that's awaiting for me? So he basically put that superstitious belief to the side. So sometimes beliefs that are not built on solid foundation, they can be eliminated in a moment's time when there is a conflict of interest. So basically, he decided, you know what, I don't care about this lottery that I just lost, basically. He gets on his horse and he starts racing. He starts racing as fast as he can go. And uh, until he saw them at a distance. So he saw this group of people, the three individuals that are traveling. And he gets close enough to them that he can hear the recitation of Rasulullah The Messenger of God was reciting Quran. Again, this teaches us part of his tradition is that when he's traveling, he's engaged in worshiping his Lord. He would make dua, he would make dhikr, he would recite Quran. That's something that people should do when they travel. When we're riding in our vehicles, again, we drive a lot, right? We're constantly traveling in this area. So whenever you're doing that, either listen to the Quran or recite Quran if you have it memorized. If you don't want to recite, then just make dhikr. Say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wa allahu akbar. And you don't even recognize or you don't even realize how fast the time goes. You may have a journey for an hour, but you can do your whole wird for the day and it's your spiritual protection and your spiritual immunity. And you didn't lose anything. You didn't lose any appointment time. You didn't lose any time out of, out of work. You were actually just utilizing and making the most out of your traffic day. And you can do so much. In our day, our time is so limited that if you don't set time for your religious obligations, you're not going to have time for them. Something else is going to come and, and take it. At any rate, he heard the Messenger of God reciting. But the Messenger of God, one of his traditions was that especially in this journey, now this journey he's running for his life and he recognizes that there is a bounty on his head and that they're looking for him and they want him dead. You know, it's like a wanted man, but they'd realize to get him dead instead of alive. He would not turn back. You know, when people tell you, watch your back, the Messenger of God did not watch his back. His sunnah was that he would walk straight. And that if somebody called him out of his etiquette and his manners, he wouldn't just turn his face to the person. He would turn his whole body all the way around to give people his undivided attention. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But Abu Bakr now was so concerned with the well-being of the messenger, he was constantly watching his back. Because he knew where people are after us. And basically, whether we realize it or not, somebody's going to catch up to us. So Abu Bakr says, O messenger of God, there is one of the people right behind us chasing after us. So then the messenger tells them the following. And we've heard this quote before, but most people are familiar with this quote whenever they were in the cave, in the beginning of the journey. You know, in the beginning of the journey, they spent three days in Ghar Thawr, which was the south side of Mecca, to trick the people. They didn't go north, although Medina is up north. They went south, and then they took this coastal freeway instead of the typical caravan road. So they stayed there and in there when they came and they approached them. And again, the cave was 
situated in a way most people think of a cave as like a room in the mountain but Thor was actually a hole that's stuck down in the ground of the mountain and that's why they were standing on top of them and Abu Bakr says oh messenger of God if they just look at their shoelaces they would see us and the messenger of God says this same statement لا تحزن إن الله معنا. don't be sad but also hazan could be anxiety and it could mean depression <laughs> because when you feel like somebody's gonna get you there's not much to be hopeful for so he's like don't feel down and don't be depressed don't be anxious because God is with us then in this instance so constantly he believes in this this is not a one-off thing that you know you just say it in the cave the messenger of God realized that God is constantly watching over him and that's why when he said this he believed in it so then he makes another dua so he says don't be sad right now although the guy is right after them right behind them uh, chasing after them on horseback he says Allahumma kfinahu bima shit Allahumma sra'hu he says a very beautiful dua he says oh God take care of him in whatever way you see fit and I ask you to bring him down to knock him down sara is when you fall off or you, you basically get defeated in a wrestling match. When you get overdone by somebody who's more powerful than you. And all of a sudden this horse, this Arabian horse that was sprinting and going straight across the desert. All of a sudden started sinking down in the sand. Now earlier we said, because the sand of Arabia, it's not all you know, sand dunes. Because that's what people imagine, you know, they see the great Saharas and like that's how it looks. In the Hijaz area, it's actually very solid. It's rocky ground because it's volcanic valleys. So earlier when the horse was, was going, it's like basically all solid ground. And all of a sudden now, the horse's feet are sinking in the sand all the way down to the horse's chest. As if it was going down through some mud. What do they call it? Quicksand, right? But this is not quicksand because the messenger just passed by it. Quicksand doesn't formulate all of a sudden like that. They had just walked right in front of him and they didn't have quicksand with them. But all of a sudden now, this particular horse is sinking. And then the person on horseback, he falls down. Which is what, this is the prayer of the messenger being answered on the spot. So that was another thing that the messengers, when they pray to God, they pray with conviction and their prayers get answered. So this man is shocked. He could not believe what just happened. He's looking at his horse in utter disbelief. You know, like he's, he's got his mouth open. He's like, what just happened right now? I can't even believe what just happened. He's like, my horse is sinking in the middle of the desert. This is not heard of. And he's like, and I know this ground. He's a local. He's not somebody like, you know, when we say nomads, it means they know the roads that they travel on. They're not going to get lost. And he, he knew that we were on solid ground. How did this happen? So he recognized immediately this guy's prayer was answered on the spot. So he calls out and he says, Ya Muhammad, Inni qad alimtu anna hadha amaluk. Look, I'm convinced this is something you did. Right? So immediately, all of a sudden, although this guy is a disbeliever, he's a pagan, but something is waking him up right now. And he says, He's like, I realize that you prayed against me. You just cursed me. He says, I ask you to ask God. Because these people, the pagans of Arabia, believed in God. Their problem was their belief system had been corrupted and switched. But they were not atheists. They believed in God. They believed in a supreme being. But unfortunately, they had changed up the belief system that Abraham left the people of Arabia with. And that was the issue. And part of the task of the Messenger of God was to revive that original belief that only God is in charge, only God is in control, and God is the one that deserves devotion and worship. So he says, pray to God to save me from what I find myself in, and I swear by God that I won't bring you guys any harm. I'm not going to hurt you. وَلَا يَأْتِيكُمْ مِنِّي شَيْءٌ تَكْرَهُونَهُ you're not going to see any harm coming from my side. He's like, at that moment, the Messenger of God prayed for him. 
What do you think he prayed for? Oh God, relieve him of what he's in. Right? He's going through difficulty. Relieve him of that difficulty. And all of a sudden the horse stands up. And starts getting excited. When the feet came off of the earth. It says that this is a guy. He's witnessing this because he narrates the story. He says, I witnessed smoke coming down from underneath my horse all the way up to the sky looking like a hurricane looking like a tornado yeah you guys have been going through some winds right right the prophet وسلم, whenever the wind would pick up he would constantly get moved his facial expressions would change and he would make dua oh allah i ask you for the best of what this wind brings and i ask your protection from the evil that it may bring I was driving today in the, in the, in the neighborhood because I, I visited San Bernardino today and in the, native, in the neighborhood, a tree had been uprooted and it was, it was on in the, in the front yard and the roots of the tree came out of the ground and the whole lawn is ripped, right? So I didn't realize because where we live, there isn't much wind now anymore. But winds are 40 miles an hour and things are getting knocked down and there is a lot of things that happen so this guy saw something like that so he's like okay so i just saw two signs i saw what happened to my horse and i saw myself falling down and i'm a expert horseback rider then i see him praying again and my horse gets up and all of a sudden now i see a tornado from underneath my horse going all the way up to the heavens so he said to himself I don't have a doubt that this man is going to have authority in the land and this man is going to make it and he said this man is going to be victorious but he felt because again he's not refined yet his belief system is still corrupt he says if this man becomes victorious he's going to ask for my head because I nearly came and killed him right now. He's going to ask for this Bedouin from Beni Mudlij. From this particular tribe. So he said. I want to make sure to. Get something from him right now. To protect me in the future. I don't want to risk. What the future holds for me. So he says. He says, I am Suraqa. Suraqa ibn Jush'um. That's his name. And he says, please allow me to speak to you. So then the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam, told Abu Bakr, why don't you tell him what is it that he wants from us? So Suraqa said, I want you to write down a document for me. To make a promise that will be a sign for me to see in the future a sign for me to have protection basically I want immunity I want you to write a document that spares me from any consequence of my action right now so they stopped and he came all the way to them then the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said your people have promised you to give you this bounty he says why don't you tell them? He, he, he said, um, he says to the messenger of God, now this is Suraqa speaking. He says, your people have a bounty on your head. And he reports back to them fully. And he says, this is what people are talking about. And he says, do you guys want food? Do you want drink? Do you want something for the trip? And they refuse to take anything from him. He's like, you guys are going to come across some of my animals you're going to come across some of my sheep because he's a bedouin so he's got property in the desert he's like you guys are going to come by my camels and my sheep take whatever you want of it so then the messenger of god وسلم, says we have no need for any of your stuff so he asks him and he says ask me for anything just give me some instruction he says just don't expose us 
أخفي عنا ولا تتركنا أحدا يلحق بنا. He says, just don't expose us and don't allow anyone to chase after us. That's all we request. Then he gives instruction to Amr ibn Fuhayra. Amr is who? Is the expert guide. He says, write down a document for him in whatever they can find. Of course, they didn't have paper at that time. So whenever we hear this word, because again, he says, اكتب لي كتابا. So if we're going to have a literal translation of this, it would say, write a book for me. Because that's how they translate kitab. But in Arabic, kitab is any document that's written is called a kitab. One piece of paper, if this sheet, I decide to write something on it, it becomes a kitab. The board is called a kitab. Any written document is a kitab. In fact, kitab in Arabic simply means to bring words together. Whether they're spoken words or written words. That's called a kitab. So basically, they had something made out of leather and they wrote on it. And then he gave it to him. So the man put it in his arrow basket and he goes back. And whenever he sees somebody on that way, he tells them, go back. There's no need for you to go because I've already checked out that area and there's no one there. He's like, you guys know I'm an expert in this area and I've already checked it out and I've surveyed it and nobody's there. Um, so then basically whoever decides to go that path, turns around and goes somewhere else. These years pass by very quickly. The Messenger of God وسلم, now migrates to Medina. He's established in Medina and people are hearing the news. Throughout this road trip, and basically those tribes between Mecca and Medina, they were hearing the news that this man established himself. He's got a community that's protecting him. People are embracing his faith all the way until Mecca was conquered. Eight years later, basically, there is the conquest of Mecca. And the Muslims now, all of a sudden, have authority all over Arabia. Then shortly after, one of the biggest tribes called Hawazin is also defeated. Hawazin and Hunayn. Both of these events are mentioned in the Quran. Hunayn is mentioned in the Quran and the conquest of Mecca is mentioned in the Quran. And then he also puts, lays Ta'if under siege. Ta'if was the city that kicked him out before he migrated to Medina. He went to them because he thought, my people don't accept me, so I'm going to go there and call these people to God. And they really uh, mistreated him. So this news now is people are embracing Islam. So he goes and he takes the document that was written for him, this, this promise of you. It's kind of like a warranty, right? A warranty is a sheet that has some type of promise for you. So he goes... And he meets the Messenger وسلم, while he's right outside the outskirts of Mecca. And he notices that the Messenger is surrounded by soldiers. So then he goes in between these soldiers and they're telling him, What do you want? And they're all, they all have weapons and they're like, What are you doing here? You know, you're like, You're walking into the wrong area. And he says, I want Muhammad وسلم, and he sees him on his camel back. And he sees that the Messenger of God, because when you're on camelback, what he was wearing is an izar, which is the lower garment that covers the body. And his leg, the bottom part of his leg was exposed. And he says, I was seeing it and it was bright and it was illuminating. And that's how they would describe the Messenger of God. Of course, he had physical beauty, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So things would stand out whenever they would describe his physical uh, appearance. So then he gives them the document. He says, O Messenger of God, this is the document you wrote for me. This is the warranty you gave me. I am Suraqa ibn Jush'um. Now we hear this more than once, by the way. People say the Messenger of God wrote something. In reality, the Messenger of God did not write. What did he do? He instructed someone to write. He dictated words just like the Quran. That's how it was documented in his lifetime. He never wrote it down. But he dictated it to his people and the people wrote it down, whoever was able to write. He had specific scribes. So it's the same story here. So then the Messenger of God وسلم, tells him, Naam al yawm yawm wa wa birrin wa sidq udnu. He says, yes, that is true. Today is a day of fulfilling promises. That's what wafa is. Wafa is when you are loyal and you fulfill a promise. So that's why when you have a debt, and it's due at a particular date. When you go and 
pay it back, that's called wafa'uddain. What did you just do? You were loyal to the promise that you made. You said, I'm going to pay you in day X, Y, or Z. And you pay back, so that's called wafa. So being true to your promise. He says, today is a day of truthfulness to fulfill promises and a day of treating people kindly. Birrin, wasidqin, truthfulness. He says, come close. So Suraqa comes close to the Messenger of God and he announces his Islam. Now, this is actually one of the few occasions because this, this actually is like a side topic, which is announcement of people's embracing of Islam, like the Shahada being announced. The Shahada being announced did not necessarily take place in front of people all the time. Many of us think that if somebody wants to embrace Islam, it's got to be on a Friday after the khutbah where the masjid is packed. And then you bring the individual all the way up to the front and you give them a mic, you put it in their face. And you tell them repeat after you and it's a foreign language and the person is shaking and they're traumatized. And then a thousand people give him a hug and kiss and, you know, he's never been hugged and kissed that many times in his life, right? And we think this is actually a prophet's tradition. That's not the tra tradition of the prophet. Shahada was basically whatever took place naturally. It wasn't set up. It wasn't like, you know, a screenplay, like a movie. It wasn't uh, something that that had a specific way about it. It's just, if somebody wanted to embrace the faith, the Messenger of God would facilitate that for them. So it's good actually for us to challenge some of these norms that have been normalized. Because that's not actually from Islam. And if the person is going to feel bad, or they're going to regret this, because this is a state where someone is actually very vulnerable. Spiritually, they're vulnerable because they're opening up and they don't know any better. So whatever you tell them, they're going to do it. You tell them jump, they'll jump. Because they're like, well, you know, I'm brand new, I don't know anything. And mashallah, all the Muslims are experts in this. So everybody decides to tell them something. The guy's like, what's your name? He's like, my name is George. He's like, no, 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 brother, your name is Muhammad. That's it. From today, your name is changed. Who told you that's part of Islam? When did the Messenger of God change people's names? There's only a few occasions where people had negative sounding names that these names were changed. And it wasn't at the moment of embracing Islam. Brother, you can't dress this way. I have clothes for you. Come with me. You go to your car and you give them part of your ethnic clothing as part of the shahada. Right? Before the person does anything, you're like, all of a sudden you just made him lose his identity 100%. That's not from Islam. There is no evidence to, to, to that whatsoever. Even saying the shahada in Arabic is not a requirement. Yes, it's recommended for those who are able to, but just imagine you're speaking a foreign tongue and you're repeating a whole statement and you're going to fumble it and you're going to make mistakes in it, especially in the presence of other people. Nobody likes to speak in public. Not everybody's a public speaker. And now you got this person on the mic and just imagine if the mic is messed up and it's got problems, it starts echoing or it's making crazy sounds. This individual is just terrified. And people are just, yeah, please. Go. Because people are about what? The spectacle. It's like a show. And it's not really the shahada ceremony. It's not for the person making the shahada. Who is it for? It's for the crowd. Just like any other spectacle. So it's for people to feel good. It's not for this poor person that just embraced Islam. Right? So none of us actually care about their feelings. The reality is, after those hugs in the original ceremony, you don't see them again. So it's basically just like a football match. You go, you celebrate, you're a cheerleader. You don't have a relationship with the teams. They're just performers. But it made you feel good. Oh, okay. This is proof that Islam is the truth. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. What's your proof? Well, every week we have a shahada in our mosque. Where are these people after a couple of weeks? I don't know. They made shahada. Did you realize they left? They came in from one door. It's a revolving door story. They come in from one door, they leave out the other. It's not a community. There's no support. There's no love. May Allah protect us and guide us to show what the Messenger of God showed these people. But anyway, this guy, Suraqa, now embraces Islam in front of people. And he recognized, like, he had a lot of emotions at this moment. Like, just imagine, what is his interaction with the messenger of God? He knows two things. He's like, look, I nearly got close to this guy, and I was about to get 200 camels. And in the middle of the desert, I saw these miracles happen before my eyes. He made me a promise, and he's fulfilling his promise today. He didn't say this Bedouin was chasing after me. Get him right now. Arrest him. Because that's what people typically do when they're, when they're weak, they may be able to forgive, but when they have strength and power, it's very difficult for them to forgive. 
So he's having a lot of things, and at the same time, he's amazed, he's almost in shock, and he has this awe of the Messenger of God that's right in front of him. So then, he wanted to ask for something, and he's like, O oh, Messenger of God, he asked him a question, he says, if I see a lost camel that's coming to drink from the camel, the, the water of my camels, right? I prepared some water for my own camels and this random camel comes in and it's lost. It's not my property. Will I be rewarded for giving it water? So then the Messenger of God says, Naam fi kulli kabidin harra ajrun. This is actually a huge principle in Islam. In another wording of this narration, fi kulli kabidin ratibin sadaqa. The Messenger of God told him, yes, every living being, but specifically he says, anything that has a liver that's functioning, you're going to get reward for helping it to be alive. So offering it drink will get your reward. This is something to teach us that regardless whether it's your property or not, whether it's your pet or not, if you feed it, if you're allowed to, of course you don't want to get in trouble. Don't go to your neighbor's dog and start feeding it and then the neighbor gets mad at you calls 911 on you don't do that so, well i just read the hadith the hadith says i get reward for feeding you know animals this is a stray animal right um now why would he ask this question because he sees everyone is asking the messenger of god questions during hajj everyone has questions so he's like i feel lost you know i got all these emotions but what is his environment it's camels where does he live? In the desert. What typically happens? Somebody loses a camel and this random camel shows up. So that's what he decided to ask about. So the Messenger of God وسلم, smiled at him, brought him close to him, uh, welcomed him, was very accommodating of him, and he did not remind him of anything from his past. I mean, just imagine. You know when we talk about traumatizing experiences? This is like the definition of trauma. Right now we're hearing about trauma and somebody's scaring you, even if they don't actually commit a crime, but just pushing you or going after you or pulling a gun in front of your face. That's a traumatic experience. The Messenger of God faced this traumatic experience, but how did he deal with it here? And again, this is not to undermine anyone who goes through a traumatic experience, but this shows us that the Messenger of God was beyond how human beings react. Many people can't recover from these experiences. In fact, when they see the person who harmed them, they get triggered. If they hear their name, they get triggered. The messenger of God here was able to control his emotions and not recall that this guy, eight years earlier, was after me trying to kill me. So he did not mention anything as if it didn't even happen. Now, this person had no doubt that in that moment, I no longer need this warranty because of the reaction of the Messenger of God, right? Like, before Islam, this guy was like, I wonder if I'm going to be safe. But at this moment, with his interaction with the Messenger of God, he's like, I don't need anything. I know that I'm safe. I don't need to present any documents. So then Suraqa goes back to his people and Basically, what he does is he takes a bunch of his camels, because that was his property, and then he takes it to the Messenger of God, and he donates it in charity. Who was this person? Earlier was looking for a bounty on the Prophet's head to gain extra camels. But this is what faith does. He switches from being an enemy to being a complete loyal servant of God. So he says there is amazing lessons in this particular story. Number one, that Suraqa would actually ask for this warranty from the Messenger of God in that particular condition. Like of all the things he could ask for, he asked for a warranty. Now, uh, did you ever hear of something like that where, so this is like a gangster, a highway robbery, chasing after someone, and then they fall down and they trip, right? And then they ask the person they're chasing, please give me a warranty for the future. Who's supposed to be scared of who? who? Who's supposed to ask for a warranty in this time? It would be the person that's being chased. The one that's on the receiving end of this trauma. He says the second lesson is, 
considering how in the beginning of this particular day, Suraqa was fully invested in finding the messenger and killing him. Or arresting him and presenting him to the Quraysh. But by the evening time, he was protecting the messenger's honor and even defending him from anyone else that's chasing after him. Things like that can happen. Most people think, no, 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 these enemies, they'll never change. These people are hardcore enemies. The hearts are under God's control and He can change them whichever way He wants. But unfortunately, human beings can't conceptualize that. This guy was going after the Messenger of God and he switched in a moment's time because he saw something. Something that he couldn't explain logically. But it affected him and it changed his mind. He says the third lesson is how amazing is the difference between the two meetings. The original meeting that he had you know, when the messenger was migrating in the middle of the desert and all he had was his friend Abu Bakr and his Dalil, his guide. And uh, he had these two camels with them. And then all these Arabian tribes in the coastal area of Hijaz, they're after him. They're looking for him to ambush him. Then he meets him again and he sees. And so look, he was in solitude, right? The messenger of God was running for his life. Eight years later, He's got thousands of people, 10,000 people surrounding him. That's the second meeting. 10,000 people, not just 10,000 people like that are uh, weak individuals. These were the top soldiers of Arabia that had just conquered Mecca and just won one battle after the other and they are basically victorious. These are the soldiers of Muhammad wasallam. And that moment, all of the Arabian tribes in the coastal area were coming to him to embrace the faith and to say, we submit. So again, what an amazing change of events. Number four, he says also, Suraqa, the same individual, the same person, look at the difference between him when he was being aggressive in seeking the messenger of God due to the desire of increasing his wealth and uh, bringing about more camels to his uh, to, to his property. And now the second Suraqa. So this is the same individual. Suraqa before and Suraqa after. You know, right now most of us, when we think before and after, we see pictures of people before the diet and after the diet. Right? So imagine this. Imagine Suraqa here. The first Suraqa is the Suraqa that's uh, power hungry. Suraqa that is materialistic. Suraqa that's looking for the bounty. He's a bounty hunter. Right? That's all he cares about. He's looking for that prize, 200 camels. That's basically something that once I have, I'll retire. I don't longer have to work. And then the after picture is Suraqa, who's bringing camels to the messenger of God to support the community in charity. Same individual. Huge difference. And he says, finally, how short and how brief are these eight years when it comes to human history? Eight years pass by extremely quickly. Right? It goes back just like this. Like, uh, like a very quick event. But in the life of the Messenger وسلم, those eight years were amazing years full of events. They were eventful years. And basically in those years you have Badr. You have Uhud. You have Khandaq. You have Hudaybiyah. You have the conquest of Mecca. And then... Suraqa is seeing all of these things. To him, these are all contradictions. Suraqa, again, didn't know much about this man other than, I just know this guy is in trouble, and if I get him, I'm going to have a lot of richness. Right? A lot of riches, and I'll become rich. All of a sudden, he sees all these events, right? So when we talk about Badr, that's the year two after the migration. Uhud, the year three. Khandaq, the year five. Hudaybiyah, the year seven. Uh, or, or six plus or minus and then finally the conquest of Mecca the year eight so he sees all of these events within an eight year period of time now there was many other things that happened during this time period but why is he highlighting battles because this is again when the messenger of God faced his enemies those are the same individuals that had done what set that bounty on his head and he's saying wow this is like he keeps on winning every single time he meets with his enemies. Although he's weak and his community is not that powerful, yet he's being supported. So again, this shows us that 
um, the way humans operate and the way God operates is completely different. And God's promise is true. And remember what the messenger said in this story, Inna Allah ma'ana. God is with us. So when God is with you, it doesn't matter who's against you. But you have to have confidence in that. You have to actually be convinced in that promise of God. And you have to be constantly with God. So remember, just a few things, a few lessons. The messenger of God, as he's traveling, he didn't migrate on his own. You know, we are told that before he migrates, he tells Abu Bakr, he goes to him one day and he says, my Lord has given me permission to travel. So he was awaiting for permission. And this is the messenger of God. But he's waiting for instructions. And then Abu Bakr says, may I please join you? And he says, yes, you may. Right, so the story is amazing, full of lessons. We ask Allah to bless this messenger Muhammad. And you know, Suraqa, what's interesting about Suraqa is there is some other event that most people know about Suraqa, which is way later on after the Prophet passes away. And Suraqa basically is gifted something as an old man. He's gifted some jewelry that belonged to the king of Persia, right? Because that was again another thing that he may have been promised. Again, as far as the authenticity of that story or not, I would have to research it. But that's what most people know Suraqa as. Because they announced after Persia was dominated, the spoils of war and the property of the king, and they took certain things from the king's property and they said this was preserved specifically for Suraqa. So again, the promise of the Messenger of God is true. He fulfilled his promises. We ask Allah to make us of those who fulfill their promises. So, Kitabu Aman is the document today or the, the lesson today, which is a, uh, a warranty, right? A warranty of protection. We ask Allah to bless the Messenger Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. Kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim, inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. Kama barik ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim, inna ka hamidun majid. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ويسكى الله تجيب us the best of this life and the best of the next life and to protect us from the fire اللهم أعنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك ويسكى الله to help us to remember you and to mention you at all times to be grateful to you for all your blessings and to worship you in the best of ways and the most excellent of manners according to the way shown by your messenger محمد ويسكى الله to make us of those who fulfill their promises as our messenger of God fulfilled his promise. We ask you not to make us blinded by power, by authority, by wealth, where we are not able to fulfill promises that we made when we were in a state of weakness, in a state of poverty, in a state of, uh, in a state of persecution. We ask you, Allah, to make us upright. We ask you to make us of those who follow the best of the speech that they hear. We ask you, Allah, to show us the truth as truth and to guide us to follow it. Show us falsehood as falsehood and to keep us away from it and don't make things ambiguous for us where we will be led astray. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa wa rizuqna attiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatila wa rizuqna ajtinaaba wa la taj'alhum multabisan alayna fa nadil we ask you to bless the Messenger Muhammad to elevate his mention and rank and to shower him with protection and grace along with his family and his righteous followers as he did with Ibrahim his family and righteous followers in the past. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk Allah is far above any imperfection we testify that he is the only one deserving of worship. We praise him. We seek his forgiveness and we repent to him. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Saad, for the water.